Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Carol Edgarian to discuss her new novel, Vera, a grand adventure set in 1906 San Francisco, featuring an indomitable heroine coming of age in the aftermath of catastrophe and her quest for love and reinvention. Carol Edgarian is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Three Stages of Amazement, and the international bestseller, Rise the Euphrates, winner of the ANC Freedom Prize. Her articles and essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, NPR, and W, among many others. She is co-founder of the nonprofit Narrative, a leading publisher of fiction, poetry, and art, and Narrative in the Schools, which provides reading and writing resources to teachers and students around the world. Carol lives with her family in San Francisco. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Amy Bloom. Amy is the author of two New York Times bestsellers and three collections of short stories, a children's book and a groundbreaking collection of essays. She's been a nominee for both the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's written many pilot scripts for cable and network, and she created, wrote, and ran the excellent short-lived series State of Mind, starring Lily Taylor. She lives in Connecticut and is now Wesleyan University's Shapiro Silverberg Professor of Creative Writing. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions. Please do so. Uh, click the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we're going to have a chance to answer lots of them. Um, you can order your copy of Vera from Books and Books below or any other book that you might want by pressing the green button. No, please know that we appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Welcome, Carol. Well, hello. Welcome, Amy. Hello. Hello. Hi, my hello. friend. Hi, Carol. It's so nice to see you. So nice to see. Look at the lengths we have to go to to see each other. It's, yeah, it's, a, lot, it's, it's a lot of work. It'll, it'll be easier. And I keep thinking, you know, hope is a discipline. We have to appreciate Zoom. We appreciate Zoom. And I have my glass. Do you have your glass? You betcha. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. I hope you all have a glass, even though on the West Coast, a little early. It's Friday. It's, it's Friday. Friday. It's five o'clock somewhere. Do you, could I get you literally first things first to read the first page of first things from this beautiful, exciting, funny, heartbreaking novel? Thank you. I would love to. Sure. First things. I always thought of my city as a woman, but the house it turned out was a woman too. When the quake hit, she groaned. Her timbers strained to hold on to their pins, the pins snapping, and the rocks beneath the house, they had voices too. And if ever I wondered how long it would take for the world to end, I know. 45 seconds. An unearthly stillness preceded and followed the shaking. It's what we did and didn't do in the stillness that determined the rest of our days. I lost two mothers that year. The first was Rose. I can't say where she was born or where her kin came from. The fact is, I don't know what mix of blood flows through me. I suspect there's some Persian, possibly Armenian, I understand there may be some Northern African and Spanish in the mix too, and a good pour of French, Spanish by way of Mexico. None of this Rose would confirm or deny. We're mutts, she said, and left it at that. One of the harlots claimed that Rose had been found as a waif in the slums of Mexico City. For a fee, she was brought North. I believe that. I believe most anything when it comes to Rose. She spoke five languages, her hair was blue-black, her skin copper, her eyes green. In San Francisco, she became a much-favored prostitute 
catering to the gold rush miners. Her next clients were the fellows who came after the miners, the suit wearing bankers and merchants who thought they could gentle a murderous gambling whoring town. They thought they could gentle Rose. Instead, she became the grand dame of the Barbary Coast, the Rose of the Rose. She did not raise me. That duty fell to a Swedish widow employed to bring me up to be, I suppose, anything but a hooker. In that, Maury Johnson was successful. I am not a hooker. I am only a thief. I love that opening. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, it, it seems to me that if somebody um, was going to do first things first with you, um, one of the things they would say would be, why, you know, it's, it's, it's what I learned in, in analysis, right? Why this? Why now? What drew you to this, this apocalypse, this quake, this, this, this scene of destruction at that particular time in the world, 1906? And, um, yeah. Yeah. and what, um, what drew you there and what kept you there? Well, I was fascinated, you know, here in, I've, I've lived in this adopted town of San Francisco for some decades now. And when I first got here, I started collecting stuff on the 1906 quake. You know, you can't live here and not think, oh, the next one's coming any minute. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by this notion of within 45 seconds, uh, an entire society collapse, can collapse. Uh, what do you do? Who are you uh, before and after? But I didn't think I'd be writing about it necessarily, um, though I kept collecting books. So certainly, it, it and interestingly, I put them on a shelf between politics, uh, politics actually below, and medical stuff above, and mm -hmm. sort of off from fiction. And they were percolating um, in the way that, as you know, things do. Um, and then uh, I had the notion of writing a kind of adventure tale um, that that took took a, a young girl um, all the way through to crone to to being a crone um, and to write a contrary character a character who had a lot of complexity but as in all my characters was essentially an outsider a misfit. Um, uh, half orphan. And when I started this book, it was before the 2016 election. And the more I thought about conjuring these different characters, I thought about, it just seemed to me our society was on the verge of collapse. And uh, it, it struck me that to talk about that, to talk about those who are marginalized, those who uh, those who are what society imposes on us and what is outside society and what happens when the world ends, who and what rises. It seemed to me that to, to, to put the nexus of a story in 1906, when not only did the earthquake happen and the fire, which essentially uh, turned 500 city blocks to ashes, but also at that time, there was a crooked mayor and the town of San Francisco was being run by a party boss who owned everybody, you know, the sheriff, the board of supervisors, and the mayor who was a, a rather good looking violinist <laughs> mm -hmm. named Eugene Schmitz. And they were about to be indicted, Eugene Schmitz and this fellow Abruff on the morning of the quake. And instead they got a disaster. So interesting, you know, as I was researching and writing it, Something that you and I haven't talked about that I, I, is the odd thing about this book writing thing that we do. You, you might be writing as you have about a much earlier time, and you're writing it in the moment that you're living, but it's read in an entirely different moment. So I finished the book in January of 2020, never realizing that we were about to have our own 
uh, epic disaster of the pandemic um, that would just, uh, not to mention all the politics of, of 2020. So, um, you know, readers come to novels that it, they read in context of the moment they find the book, right? So we're in, we're in lots of different times here and we're in today. I mean, haven't you found that, that, you know, in, in, in writing, um, in writing of the past, you're, you're, you're both straddling that and what is moving through you in the moment? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, you write it, you research it at one point following one river, and then you write it at another point in the middle of some other body right. of water, and then it is published, and you're like, oh, bye. See you out there, you know, so much later than when you began. I was wondering what you did to either let in or keep out, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019. How was that for you in terms of writing about this sort of <clears throat> wild, corrupt, um, uh, what, what I think of as a, a tremendous stage for performance of government in that period in, in the early 1900s, especially in yeah. San Francisco, where they were barely getting laws to manage the world that they lived in. And I just, I wondered, did you find a lot of news coming in? Did you find that you had to keep some of the news out? Well, I, I go deep down the whole of research, if nothing else, to, to, to learn about the time, but also to find those little, those little side, those side turns that feel, um, that invite story. Um, and so I get sort of saturated. And then once the characters really become real, it's about where are they connecting and where are they not connecting? I mean, I, I, I think about, um, I wonder if this is true for you too, but you know, um, someone was asking me in another interview, you know, what, when did you know you were a writer? And I don't, I mean, I can think of moments when I knew, um, I was certainly a reader first and writer, writer second, but a writer early. But more than that, what I remember is at a very young age, just wondering what makes people tick. Yes. And so really that's what we do on the page. So at a certain point, there's the life you're living, but you're, you're moment to moment on the page trying to figure out what makes these people tick and where can, how can I put them in extreme situations so they either connect or don't connect? Are they either, they, how do they show up for each other or fail to? Um, so that's a long way of saying, um, I think there comes a point, I wonder if this is true for you too, where the novel in some ways feels more real um, than, than what I'm living. Well, yeah, I mean, it's sort of the good news and the bad news. It feels right. more real and one is sort of, one longs for it, you know, and you hate to put it away um, and it comes and it goes, it sort of waxes and wanes. I think for, for those of us who, love a good story, but cannot write without our people, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's always the people that you come back to. I was wondering in the midst of um, um, a Vera, who is such a great hero, if you have a, a less obvious favorite than your central protagonist, if there's somebody else in the book who really regardless of how they may seem to the reader or to other people in the story, sort of has your heart in, some, in, in a good or bad way? Um, that would be Tan. Mm -hmm. That would be Tan. Um, Tan was really fun to write and he was challenging to write mm -hmm. because, um, you know, here is somebody who in, in, in another time would have, um, would have the possibility of, of, a, of a life much fuller than the life he was destined to have because he was a Chinese servant in 1906, 
pre-quake, I'm talking, but he knew he knew food, he knew wine, he knew how to run a house. He knew, um, most importantly to, for Vera, he knew how to make a family. He knew how to love his daughter, how to honor his father. Um, he yet, because he was a Chinese servant in 1906, he was destined to live in a basement on a dirt floor with, you know, crappy furniture um, and, and, and was penniless essentially. And, but, but that was pre-Quake. And of course he, he, he was, he was Vera's rival. Um, they mm -hmm. didn't, they really just, dis they really despised right. each other in the beginning. And there's nothing like two, two rivals if they're worthy rivals, that's really fun to write and fun on the other side of the quake, how their dance, how to, you know, the challenge for me was to give him his fullness, his wrong rightness, his complexity, mm -hmm. never diminish that or make it easy. Mm -hmm. um, but also their dance, to make their dance feel real. You know, it was, it's not a, it's not a love fest, but it is a real partnership and, and ultimately, um, more than that, um, but he was really, he, he was, he, he won my heart. Mm -hmm. He won my heart. He was big. He was big. And I, um, I wished for him. And I also wished, I, I had to modulate my wishing for him that, 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 that it, it was real to the time. Yes. I mean, there's nothing, one of the things I think that makes this, um, such a, a complex pleasure to read is that there's nothing fairy tale about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there are no unexpected flowers opening by the side of the road. You know, the mice don't turn into footmen, the pumpkins don't turn into coaches. You know, if every if anything, you know, half the pumpkins get smashed. Yeah. And people are forced to walk home, you know. In the in the debris and in their rags, and 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 it is not. Um, there's nothing grim about it. Um, I was wondering when. I, it always seems to me that one doesn't really understand the book you've written for a couple of years afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I, alas, alas. Yeah. Well, you realize yeah. the book you think you wrote, nobody reads. <laughs> they read another book. Oh, they're, they're reading a different book entirely. But are there things that you see that always draw you, that always pop up in the book, that always bring you down a certain path that, you know, the, these are your people and these are the kinds of stories and this little twist, you know, for me, it's always something backstage. It's backstage at the theater. It's backstage at the opera house. It's backstage at the, at the freak show. It's always, there's always some, something backstage because it's my favorite place. I wonder if you find that there are certain stories or people or settings that always nab you? You know, there's an Armenian word, Odar, which means outsider. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm always drawn to the outsiders, having been one <laughs> mm -hmm. um, growing up. Uh, I'm drawn to those who are um, looking into the windows of the, of the warm house. Um, in one way or another, and and how do they get inside? Um, what do mm -hmm. they have to do? In this book, I really, you know, this is a book populated by thieves. Every character right. in the book is a thief. And right. I was really interested, uh, I, I was writing it in a time when it struck me every, there, there, we, were, we were a country led by thieves and, um, what is the honor among thieves? That was an interesting question for me. I'm, I, I think there's always a mother-daughter aspect at least running through, but I think I'm probably done with that right now, but it's interesting mm -hmm. to me. The lives of women are interesting to me. The lives of men and women um, from, 
from the notion of how how we connect and don't connect. I'm always like I'm always tinkering in that in that world. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I probably could go way down the path with that. Um, I like I like taking a I like politics. There's always a political. Mm -hmm. There's always a political thread, pol political and sort of societal moment of societal uh, upheaval in one way or another, because it's just inherently dramatic. And also I'm a political junkie. So um, mm -hmm. if I can talk about that in some way, um, yeah. It seems yeah. to me, I mean, it's not really for me to say, but it seems to me that part of what is really interesting to you I mean, I guess it occurs to me because I, I think we have similar interests in, in certain yeah, ways. That is that area between the sidewalk and the road. Yeah, it's that it's that kind of thing. We don't know what it's called, and it's not the surface, and it's not the very bottom. But there's something in between that moves people and drives people and leads people, and it is never what they say it is. But desire, it is, desire. You know, right. I, I think you and I, um, we we go right to desire. And the flip side, of course, is vulnerability. But what do people do when they want? Um, right. And they want, they want, they want it, they want badly. <laughs> I mean, they don't want passively. They want it and they want it now. And the foolishness, I also, um, I, I feel like, I feel like fiction needs to read like news of the day. And in that, um, I, I like to talk about ambition, which is very much an American thing. Um, but it's, 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 it's got, it's got, it's got the sort of optimism that is, that is American. And it, it has that shadow and underbelly that we're living yeah. through right now in so many levels. And like, that's, I like that terrain. I think um, I think there's there there are many places in the garden yet to dig on dig in that. Don't you think? Of oh, I do. I think especially because you know the frame on women's ambition has been. You, I mean, not 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 absence. Thank you, Henry James. Thank you, Edith yeah. Wharton. You know, yeah. but. but narrow, you know, for the scope of the ambition and um, often careful, even if it means hypocrisy, for the expression of the ambition. And, you know, I mean, you, you can look around you at the news, as I know you do, and think, oh, gosh, that doesn't seem to be that different. We still seem to have a little trouble with, you know, women wanting something besides a nice pair of shoes, not that there's anything wrong with a nice pair of shoes. Right. And I think that is one of the things that you, as you say, you know, you like to look at the flower and you like to look at the at the earth that it's growing in. Yeah. And what is underneath that? And it's it's the combination. I think if it is all sunshine and socially approved ambition, that's fine, but that's not what you write. And if it is only the dark and the dirt, that's also fine, but that's also not what you write. No, and you and I think you have to. Uh, you, you want to, and I know you know your books do this so beautifully. You want to give, you want to give to your reader as much as much of a complex ride as possible, right? Yeah. And to pull what is universal in each of us. What do we pull for? <laughs> you know, we we pull for we pull for love, but we also pull. <laughs> We also pull for for the for the the other side, and and uh, you know how much how much can how much can I awaken in my reader in terms of, of in terms of feeling, and in terms of of connection with each of the characters, and and the challenge, of course, I think in the early days you write out of your own personality, of your own. Um, expression of your people and then more and more and more um can you make a whole world who of of otherness can you can you make 
um, as many different kinds of characters who are at play and then and then get them get them at play with each other. And um, one of the things about sort of the life pre-quake and post-quake is, um, of course, an event, an event like what we're what we've lived through in the last year, or an event like like a like a devastating quake and fire. You you change, and how how do you show up? I mean, I think that's the question we we all we all asked in different ways a year ago, and now coming out of this, if in fact we're coming out of this, um, we all we all have the opportunity to look and say, well, how did I show up? You know, did I show up? And in all the ways we're being asked to show up today and how, what changed? This has been, you know, I think of my, my kids and your kids. I mean, yeah. you know, my youngest is, is not yet 20. And I mean, how the before and after in her life, um, you know, these people who survived this quake, they, they, uh, they were never the same. They were never the same. Right. And I think that that's not something people necessarily want to contemplate at this point, the way in which one has changed, the way in which one's notion of showing up has changed, the way in which one's expectation of showing up has changed. So I have a, I have a last Vera question for you. Yeah. Were there terms in the story that you were reluctant to bring upon your people? I, I remember I was writing, I was working on a novel, and my editor said to me, could you not kill her? Could you? Because <laughs> I think you could sort of see where it was going. And, you know, I, I had to really wrestle between one impulse, which was just to let it rain on her and that other impulse, which was to protect her as one of my people in the palm of my hand. But I wondered, there are so, there are so many things and twists and good and painful things that happen to your people. Mm -hmm. I wondered if there was any moment where you were like, oh, I'm sorry, it's gonna be bad. Well, um, not, not not giving it away to those who haven't read, there's a particular four-legged creature who was really hard to see go, but who had to go. And um, it was very late, um, it was very late in the drafting that someone who dies, uh, it came to me that she had kind of done her work and she needed to go and that came, and that came very late in the book, and and I think that must seem so strange to non-writers, but you you get very cold to it, and it's just who's in service to the story and who isn't, and and it sometimes takes takes a shock to to get far enough away from it to say, ah, done your We're job, done, done your We're job, done. you're out of here, you know, you're kind yeah. of holding up the group. I yeah. one thing I want to say about. Um, you know, because so much has been said about this being a book about disaster. And I really think it's a book, um, I hope it's a book about life, you know, and I loved what you said about it being funny, because the folly, the folly of everybody, of everybody in this book, like their blindness to themselves and to each other was really fun to, to shape, to to, to let play and they screw up. They try really hard and they screw yeah. up, you know? To me, it is no more a novel about disaster than to say, oh, you know, you know, my life is one of disaster, you know? Right. Sure, disasters, sure, terrible things, also beautiful things, also surprises, also things that if you wrote them, people would be like, I get out of here, you know? And I think that's the, it is actually the joy that it seems to me runs through the spine of the book, which is something about, it is, you know, it is a beating powerful heart. It is not the disaster. Thank you. 
you know, there were there was a crush of babies being born nine months after the quake. And of course there were. I mean, what do people what? do? What do people do right after they right. survive something? We're, we're alive. We're alive. You know? We're Walk alive. Away from the casket, you know, we're alive. Yeah. I wonder, um, I I could, I have plenty of questions. I could ask you stuff all, all night. I wonder if we have some questions. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, it was well, a joy. I wonder if, if there are some questions our way. We actually have one for Amy. Um, someone oh, in the audience would like to know what she's drinking. <laughs> oh, I bet you would. Um, I am drinking um, uh, some Tito's vodka with some club soda and um, a big splash of lemon juice. Delicious. So I just want to remind everyone that's watching that now is a really good time to put your questions in the ask a question button. Um, and then here's one about your influences, uh, Carol. Uh, what, have, what are your influences that you can point to throughout your life in your writing? Oh my. I know. My, you yeah, mean they, my my literary influences or my life? Well, Lord, oh, how much Lord, how, Lord, how Lord, much Lord, time Lord, do we Lord, have? Tell here? them more. Tell them like life influences. Tell them more. Tell us more. Oh, I. <sighs> where to begin? You know, I uh, this book is dedicated to my three daughters. Mm-hmm. And uh, having come, having come from a family that I would, in shorthand, say was was a, a was a coming together of gas and matches, <laughs> uh, and all that that entails. Um, this was really, um, I would say, my my influences have been. Um, you know, of uh, being very bookish from a young age. From um, I've I've been working since I was twelve, um, and um, was very lucky to be uh, the one thing my parents gave me, which I will be forever grateful to, is uh, an education. So books, they you know, I've always I've always had story as my companions. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I want to say about that? Uh, what wonderful companions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, so much about what this book is about is how there's the family we're given and the, the family we choose. And if I had said one thing to my girls, it's, you know, the chosen family is precious. It's as precious mm -hmm. as the family we it's as precious as who brung you. And it can often be really surprising. Mm -hmm. So um, here's another one. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea of how our ideas of what it means to show up might change post pandemic. As novelists, what do you both imagine those changes might look like? Take a crack, Amy. I give you a break. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't find myself doing a lot of imagining of the wider world post pandemic right this minute. Um, you know, since I find myself worrying about who's gotten the vaccine and who hasn't and what's happening with the little kids in my family and how, how is everybody doing um, and yeah. who is going back to work and who is not and who whose business has closed. Um, so, I mean, I think the work of showing up to me is no different than in any other hard time, which is, you know, what, <laughs> you know, the kind thoughts are, are not much. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate them. But in fact, you need people to, to do things perhaps a little differently, a little more intentionally, with a, um, more generosity than might be entirely comfortable. You need people to step up in ways that are different and not just say, oh, I wish I could do something. 
you know, but to look around and, um, as I was saying to Carol when we got on, you know, as my mother would have said, make an effort. Yeah. And I guess that is, that is for me really the kind of showing up that that is going to be necessary. And um, if not us, who? Yeah, it's not it's not it's not someone over your shoulder. It's you. It's you. Um, yeah, and and to keep to keep curious and to keep um, to be humble. I think there's I I I think if I think the lesson to walk forward with is a whole lot of humility about the lives other people are living and what you think you know and how aware one thinks one is and i mean that's one of the i think the real gifts about writing is you're you're always on the edge of not knowing um so you have to you you have to get somewhat comfortable with that that ambiguity that negative capability being stretched and stretched of 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 not knowing and not being entirely in control because um, I don't know, for me, I feel like I have to grow it to, to write each book. Like, I, you know, I, I start out with an idea and a notion, but I have to be, I have to get somehow bigger in order to pull it off. And I fail a lot. Yeah, it, it may be. I don't, I don't, I don't think that, um, I mean, I wish it were so, but I don't think that writers are uh, better people by and large. No. Than people who are not <laughs> no. I'm at it. I, I think I could probably go stronger in the other direction, but I do think that the requirement that you project yourself into other lives, that it's not just, oh, if I were you, but let me imagine the being of this other person from their perspective, not from mine, from right. being, and from being, not from looking. And I think that, you know, um, at least helps some writers become better people. Well, and and I'd even take it one step beyond that. And uh, a complex character doesn't show him or herself all at once. You have to have the patience to to stay back enough to bring them to 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 allow them forward um, yes. to really to really show all I'm of them. Away. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this next question segues beautifully into that. Um, someone would like to know, how do you develop your characters? Um, slowly. Ha! <laughs> slowly. Damn it. Slowly. Um, mm -hmm. Also, uh, by putting them in situations that are various. So they they have to they show up in different ways and um, and putting them together. I mean, the thing about characters, it, even lovers, even lovers on the first night, are never going to have identical desires. They're never, only rarely do they get to have that moment of like, for lack of a better word, grace, where they're actually connecting. And 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 the the angels are singing, and there is total harmony. Very very rare. So as they come up against each other, they 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 have their sword fight. They have their their conflict with each other, and they change. And and I don't know. I don't know for Amy if if, if this is true for you, but sometimes I just have to put them together, and I have to see what comes right. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes they have to go to the grocery store or sometimes somebody's mom dies and people have yeah. to show up at the funeral unexpectedly. Or sometimes uh, like the neighbor kid runs through the yard while they're making love in the backyard where they thought nobody could see them. Oops, you know, things happen. Life marches on. And I like what you said about the grace of the lovers coming together because part of what I always think is that no matter how much grace there is, Somebody's going to get a cramp. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's right. going to get snagged. Somebody's going to be like, oh, ah, 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 
or you know maybe something else yes. and um and that's you know that's also part of the grace you know mm -hmm. do you get to laugh and move on or is that the end of the moment and therefore the end of the chapter and i think and like you i am like well you didn't say this about yourself i will say it about myself i'm a horribly slow writer and um you know, so much of my work is simply staring out the window, eating Ritz crackers. I, yeah. I can't bear it. But nevertheless, that I used to think it was my children's fault, but they're big now, and so it's clearly not their fault. Well, I'm I'm equally slow, even slower. And uh, you know, at a certain point, you have to just accept that's who you are. <laughs> I mean, you know. yeah, yeah. We, we, we are our... for the marathon, I think, not the sprint. One of our viewers would like to know if Rose is based on a real person. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there were there were these madams of the town um, who were yeah. really some of the early uh, business business people. I mean, they were revered. They uh, um, they were mighty in their in their way, and because of the of the the beginnings with the miners they had really settled the town ahead of of a lot of the the civilized folk if you will or the quote normal folk um whoever that is i, I have yet to meet someone um like that um but um not she's not based on a particular one madam um i i, I certainly knew about the madams of the town but rose came to me um she came to me as a fully formed very nuanced tough lady who um who was an amazing operator but also um you know i, I had a lot of empathy for her of of, of how she was made you know mm -hmm. i mean coming up from the slums of Mexico to, as, as a prostitute when she was 12, 13 years old. You know, there's a moment later in, late in the book where Vera so wants Rose to want family, to want to be a mother. And, and, and Rose says, you know, I never had that. I never had that in me. And I, I really liked that about her, that sort of, you saw, you saw her heart kind of creak, creak, you know, you could almost hear the hinges squeaking when she tried. Mm -hmm. Yet in her calibration of what is correct, she provided for her daughter. She just couldn't love her. So Tina in our audience is saying, I love Amy's idea of intentionality. And the idea that it's not someone else who needs to take care of business, it's you. And someone is specifically asking Amy Bloom, what is your one regret? <laughs> wow. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much you all paid for this <laughs> evening. <laughs> I'm gonna drink my tequila and listen to that. <laughs> my, my one regret is small. Um, however, um i could share some i think well first of all i think i'm very lucky i think i don't actually have a lot of regrets um oh you know there are people i love who died i wish i could have spared them pain wasn't really in my power but i i regret that somehow i could not um make the ends of their lives more peaceful as I think they deserved. I, I do wish, but it's such a tiny, writerly, vulgar regret, but, but you know, you're here, so I'll tell you. Um, I didn't start writing until I was about 35 and I worked full time and I had three kids and it was like, it seems to me to be a good enough reason not to start writing until I was 35, but part of it, was that I really felt like nobody's lives should be disturbed because I was doing this odd thing in the basement, which was typing, you know, which was writing. And, um, you know, my first collection of short stories took me six years for 12 stories because I wrote between 10 and one in the morning. And then I got up and saw my son off to school and then the little ones off to school. And then I went to work and 
I could only keep that up about three nights a week, um, even though I was only 35. And I regret now that it didn't seem possible to me that there could be any room made in our life and our family and my work, my for, for me to take three hours a week when people were awake. So I, it's, it's a very self-serving regret, but I, I am a little sorry about that. And now when people ask me about writing, I say, no one will take care of your writing except you. Yeah. That is your job. It is not on other people to make sure that it's possible for you. It is on you to serve your work. So there you go. Yeah, beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for continuing. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for, so um, can we talk a little bit about your craft, Carol? Sure. Uh, just what your process is like as a writer um, every day. Do you write? Um, like, do you have a fixed writing routine or do you uh, operate with inspiration or a little of both? Oh, my. Um, well, you know, Amy and I have so much, so many, so many points of contact and so many things in common. Like you, I always was, um, when the kids were small, I was always squeezing the writing in late at night when everyone was asleep and things were calm. And then I could open the box of my imagination. And, uh, and I always had a day job and I still have a day job at narrative. So it's uh, this notion of balance is just, I, I don't even, I, it sounds I, great. It sounds, sounds great. great. I hope sounds someone great. has it. I don't right. know her. Mm -hmm. um, and I always feel as if I'm stealing the time. And to your point, it is something one has to grant oneself. Um, so what I tend to do, my process is I spend a long time in the beginning of work, um, like, like the proverbial dog, like turning circles in the grass, getting uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I can spend hours in in um in my room just staring at a wall just conjuring and thinking and where does where do the hours go and um when i'm really in the heat of a book i'm not sleeping i'm up at three uh reworking stuff i'm just <clears throat> constantly constantly um uh jiggering and uh oppressed with worry <laughs> over my people and my my story so do i have a process like am i get that cup of coffee and you know every day every day is new and every day i try to get something done i mean my husband of more than 30 years claims that i've never I've never read a set of directions that I don't have to veer from or, or you know, so I, I, make, I make a plan to have a certain set day and um, inevitably it blows up in one way or another. But the writing, um, the right, it's every day saying the writing, the writing is important, the story, the story is important and not even saying it in that way, but actually putting, putting the time in. Um, I wish my process was smoother. I aspire. Do you, I, I, I mean, do you feel like yours has gotten smoother now? Oh, uh, I yeah. feel like my writing process is the kind of thing that makes other writers feel better about themselves. I think mine too. You know, <laughs> I feel like, well, you know, you got to have coffee, maybe a little exercise, you know, so like I'm, I can move around, got to check the mail. I mean, the mail, in fact, doesn't come to like 1030, but you never know. It might come early. You come walk down to the mailbox. And then there's an interesting something to read. Oh, and look at that. Oh, you know, there's like a little pile of cigarette butts. Who was standing there? <laughs> la, la, la. 
And then I sort of drag myself down to my disgusting, beloved office, which is so terrible that um, when I moved in there, my husband put one of those stick-on Febreze things on the wall, <laughs> and it slid down. That's how disgusting it is. I love it. It's it's Doris <laughs> Lessing's number 19, come to life. I love everything about it. Um, you know, but and you, then you go, yeah. and then you dig around. You stare but here's what I will say. I wonder if you agree with this. What I have learned uh, at this stage is that all of it matters. Yeah, I, absolutely. And so, and so the notion of regret, actually what is wasted time is actually productive time. And you'd never know, you know, where, where, where the wheel is, you, you don't know when it's going to turn in the right place. So, so, um, you know, you could be losing time or wasting time and actually the story's advancing and actually something you overhear while waiting in the drugstore suddenly makes something really essential make sense. So if you don't see it as, uh, as, as linear, but as all of it, everything is everything and everything counts. And even the years that I I regret not having mm -hmm. produced something actually produced actually brought me to a new place in what I was working on. So, and you have so to hold, you have to hold on to it. You have to cherish yeah. the story. And yeah. so, like even if you have to take a break, as a friend of mine once said, if it's going well, you could write in a disco. If it's going badly, you can't write in a monastery. That's so true. <laughs> You have to give yourself that opportunity. That's right. One thing I will say is you still got to sit down. Yeah. I don't care if you sit on the couch or you sit on the floor, or you sit on that crappy chair that's terrible for your back. You got to sit and think. I mean, you can walk too, but you got to you gotta give it the time it deserves. Because life, life will logic. fill in, won't it? It will absolutely all fill in. All the time. Yeah. People like to eat. They like to have clean, how you know, whatever garbage they like to have, you know, and there are points at which you have to go, definitely not my problem. So we'll do one more question. Someone would like to know if both of you ever struggle writing people of color because it's not your personal experience. Does that become an issue for you? I think it's, it's very much an issue today and and certainly should should have been sooner and um, I just had a really fascinating um, conversation with my friend Paisley Rechdahl who's written a book that I think everyone should read about cultural appropriation and what is that and and where are what are the what are the do's and the do nots and I when we were talking about Tan, for example, um, I wouldn't presume to write from his point of view. I wouldn't presume to to um, to to speak from inside him. What I can do is show him in his fullness, in his vulnerability, with his dignity, with his complete. Um, his complete person, um, but that's that's um, I'm duty bound to do that. What yeah. do you? Yeah, I think that's a very strong answer, including the recommendation. By the way, yeah, it's you know, an amazing book, and it's a it's a book that doesn't provide a clear answer because there. This is a moment where where the pendulum correctively has swung so much in a, in a in a direction and so what was fair even five or six years ago in our culture um has to be re-examined today it's 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 really important that we do this yeah i mean i i guess i i mean i experience a lot of challenges in writing about a fairly wide range of people um, i used to say as an example that I would never have somebody 
who was Irish Catholic as my central protagonist from whose point of view I was writing because it is a universe that even though I have close friends who are Irish Catholic, mm -hmm. it's not my people. I don't know it inside and out. It's not, it does, it's not my music. It doesn't speak to me right. in the same way. Whereas the cultures that I grew up with were um, Jews and Italian Catholics and African Americans. And that was true in the culture of my childhood and is tr true in the culture of my family. And so, although, you know, one wishes to take care in a variety of ways, I think it's also important to know what you're, you know, to lean in what you do well and to uh, pay a lot of attention to what you do badly and, mm -hmm. um, and worthwhile. Um, and also, by the way, often the case with gender as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like you, I came, I came from, um, you know, the Ar Armenian, um, Armenian on one hand, Swedish orphan on the other side, first generation, and everybody in the town I grew up with. I mean, it was a total melting pot. So those, that's my music, and those are my people. Um, and I don't, I, I, I think. I think we have to fight against being narrow. We have to, we have to, um, we have to find where the connection is and you can't, and you can't, you can't bring in a story real connection if you don't bring forward people. So one of the truly wonderful things uh, about this time, even though we're not in person, can't see each other, the quality of these conversations, the intimacy mm -hmm. of them has been really just wonderful to participate in. And I just want to thank you both for your generous, you know, for your generosity in being with us here tonight in our virtual bookshop. And also, it seems that, you know, we're learning a lot about each other as human beings. Uh, I loved what both of you had to say about putting yourself in the skin of another and, mm -hmm. you know, doing it that way. And, you know, that process never ends, hopefully. Um, and, I, you know, that's, that's part of what's happening now. Maybe there's a, a sliver of hope where we can actually begin that process more and more with difference, you know, with people that are different from ourselves. So thank you very much for your time, for joining us, for your work, which we love and we celebrate at Books and Books. And um, I'll remind everyone who's in the audience watching that you can order a copy of Vera just by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen and we'll ship it right off to you. And if you're in Miami and you wanna come by one of our stores, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. But um, I thank you for watching. And I hope we'll see each other in person sometime soon in the future and stay safe and well and keep writing. And I take issue with the fact that writers are not the best people in the world because no, I, I nice say our, they're pretty nice. close. They're pretty darn close. <laughs> thank you both of you so much. And thank you all of you for, for spending this hour with us. Thank you everybody for joining us. Good night. Good, Good night. night.